less than the full two hours, especially since I absolutely want you to, uh, to respond a little more uh, than you've been doing so far. We, you remember we were talking about storytelling and especially mythical storytelling, which would be based on the idea of a pre-established narrative that um, would then apparently be retold rather than done uh, an, as, a new, as a new text. And with uh, Thomas Mann, we had the possibility, because we had this, this foreword to the novel, we had the possibility to kind of distinguish between his projections and his transference on the story and the traditions, and on the other hand, his critical deconstruction of the transference of others. Of course, we don't have that in the case of Rembrandt. We are going to talk today about Rembrandt, Joseph's, and Potiphar's wives. And we don't have such statements. Rembrandt was uh, supposedly a religious person, although nobody knows. Nobody knows anything about Rembrandt. Don't, don't believe people who claim they do. Um, but we have no reason to doubt that he took the Bible seriously. So we're not, we're not in a position, I think, to challenge that as such. Uh, nobody knows what denomination he really followed. And in a 17th century Dutch context, that is uh, saying that you really can't tell because there were many denominations. Some people claim he was a, a Mennonite, but the evidence is really very thin. Now, so we're not going to, to speculate about that. Um, let's first, before we start, you, you read this etching, right? I told you to stare at it, and I'm sure that today is going to be the most sexy session of the whole uh, series, because this etching happens to be quite sexy. But uh, before uh, we address the etching specifically, there is a lot to establish, to, uh, to put in place before. And one is the question of uh, storytelling, uh, of representing narrative time sequences in visual art. Um, and before we go to uh, talk about what Rembrandt did, I want to put in place a few devices that are, let's say, conventional devices that artists are claimed to use, and um, then immediately question to what extent they are used, and that's why I gave you uh, those two uh, Xeroxes. Does everybody have those two drawings that I sent out right now? Um, well, I have, I may, oh, oh, that one. Okay, yeah, that's the important text for today, right? That's today's novel, okay. Uh, you need one, or this is a whole bunch? I don't know. You need two, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, well, why don't you just use them? Um, so let's say that supposedly there is a problem for painters, for visual art, to represent narrative time sequence. And to, of, let's say, the problem of in unfolding time and space. And this problem seems to be at the most, the most acute when speech is represented, and we'll talk about why. Um, now, verbal narrative, as you all know, disposes of a lot of devices to manipulate time itself. So it's not the case that it's so easy for, uh, for verbal narrative to represent time. And although time is involved in the sequentiality uh, of verbal art, which in turn could be questioned, of course. And although time, um, no, sorry, although time is, seems to be involved in uh, verbal art more naturally. The so-called iconic representation of, of sequential events in sequential signs is itself subject to convention-bound distortion. And that's why you have all these chapters in narratology textbooks about uh, order reversals and uh, anachronisms and what they call it. Um, but then in the case of speech, there is no way to undo the, the temporal sequentiality of speech as, a, as a, uh, of utterance, of represented speech. And if anywhere then, it is in the representation of speech or in quoted discourse or direct discourse, that the degree of iconicity between the verbal text and the, the represented object, the speech, is the highest. But strangely enough, we saw with the Thomas Mann that it's precisely where words count and generate the story that Ma Mann's verbal work received its quality, it's, it's, its most intense quality, 
from the use of visuality. So there is a very strange thing going on there in, the, in Thomas Mann's novel that seems to question the efficacy of the efficiency of, uh, of this iconicity principle. Now, before entering, as I said, into the most dramatic representation of the myth of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, um, I would like to compare a few more conventional devices to solve the, that semiotic problem inherent to generic and, med and medial, medium-bound characteristics, and to see the use that Rembrandt makes of those conventional devices. Now, the simplest and the most widespread manner of visual representation of sequentiality is, of course, sequential visual representation, which is ultimately what led to the movie and which we know from comic strips and that kind of uh, things uh, in today's culture. And that's the, in the, the drawing that I sent out, um, did you, do you all have it? Of the beheading. There's a beheading scene which shows three phases of a process made to represent a continuum of the event. Yet, sequentiality is not alone to produce the sequential ev uh, effect. You have a sequential effect in this drawing. Nobody questions that you have here three phases of an event. But there are other devices which reduce the, the three-dimensional space to a two-dimensional surface. For example, there is the triangular composition, which is used as a metaphor for tridimensionality. Two phases during which the, the victim is still standing are uh, so the image is vertically structured because the victim is standing, are each construed at one side of the surface, which emphasizes the horizontal space. And the third phase, the moment after the act, is drawn more to the foreground to represent a time frame distinct from and following the two earlier ones. So, and it, it's enhanced by that same gesture. And this sequentiality is then also emphasized by the bolder lines of the third image. So that's why you don't mistake there is a redundancy in the sequentiality. The sequentiality. You don't mistake that here's time represented. Now, these simple devices that we immediately process, we don't question them, allow more complex interventions to pass unnoticed. You, one tends not to question, for example, that the three sub-sketches, if we take this as three sub-sketches, are part of one sketch. We don't question that nor that the three events are phases of the same basic event, a beheading. Now, the primary device, the division in three phases, which makes up for the sequentiality, obliterates other aspects, such as, I don't know if you can see that clearly enough in the, in the Xerox, the change in the killer's face, the killer. Although the primary, devi primary device of sequentiality pushes us to assume that the figures represent the same characters in each of the three images, the helping, sympathizing man at the left of the first section, right, at the left of the victim, bears no resemblance whatsoever to the frightened soldier with helmet that you hardly can see, but with the big mustaches on the, uh, on, in the second. That we assume that that's the same figure, but there is no way to argue that except through the sequentiality. And the face of the man at the right in the first image does seem to denote the same person in the two up upper image images, but his expression changes dramatically, so radically from concern in the first one to cruelty and from a sense of powerlessness to a strong commitment to his task, that the very notion of identity seems to be questioned. And in order to fill this gap between the two, we can fantasize about what may have happened between the two moments of the drawing, a conversation perhaps, maybe the victim said something that made him angry, kind of counter-conversion. Um, we can only work on this gap if we let ourselves, if we allow ourselves to project a concern of our own onto the incomplete image. In other words, the difference between the first and the second image is a screen for our transference. This is just a very simple example as evidence that that's indeed what happened. We don't, at first sight, I'm sure no, none of you question that we are dealing here with the same characters. Now, the transference that we ha make, that we put in to, between the first and the second, uh, is the baggage that we bring to the final image, the one that is both pushed onto a smaller and lower part of the surface, yet enhanced by bolder lines, so that it becomes kind of the climax. 
and which represents the beheaded man as both peacefully sleeping body, if you just see the body, it's just someone who's sleeping, and a portrait of a beautiful face that we really see for the first time. We could say that Rembrandt obeys the simple rules of conventional drawing, this sequentiality, in order to transgress other conventions more freely. And as a result, the narrative built up by means of the first becomes problematic with the second of these interventions. We, you get a completely different sense of the narrative if you look at it in a different way. Now, this is a very, let's say, very simple example of how this device can work and how it can be somehow undermined. Now, a more subtle occurrence of this device, of course, can be seen in the dagger of Lucretia in the Washington painting, if you remember from uh, uh, the first session, where you had this shadow. We have seen there that the light is frontal and that the shadow, therefore, is only understandable as an indication of movement. And the movement is rendered, as in comic strips. In comic strips, it's done by tiny lines, and here by this little blot behind, representing a shadow brought forth by the speed of the movement. That is, there is no real shadow. It is not a, it's not a shadow, in fact. It is only the sign of movement. And the oblique earrings, re you remember that oblique earring belongs to the same, uh, belongs to the same device. And, well, in fact, we should show it again, but I wonder, but this, this symmetrical thing that she, this pendant that she had in the middle is also slightly decentered. I just went to Washington and saw it again, and I saw even more symptoms of this movement. Now, this comic strip device is not enough of an alternative for the history painter. We were, we were talking about the history painter as the painter who, who has the ambition of representing this a pre-established story, right? Now, a much more common device, which can only be used on the basis of assumed knowledge of the story the work is supposed to represent, is the concentration. So we have sequentiality as a first, and our concentration of the entire story or episode in one single scenically representative event and scenically representable event. So the painter will choose a moment in the story that seems both powerful enough to represent the whole story and visual enough to be representable on uh, the canvas. This is what Rembrandt did with the story of Jacob's encounter and wrestling with the messenger of the Lord. Oh dear, we need less light. And now I need a little more light. What did we do? Did we opened the door. No, we opened the door the first time. That was just enough, yes. The wrestling, you know that story, the wrestling of Jacob with the messenger of the Lord at the river Jacob, uh, Jabok. I'll scream a little bit because of the noise of the, uh, of the machine. On his way to meet his brother Esau, whom he had wronged so deceptively years earlier. You remember the story, right? That he stole the birthright from his elder brother. Can you hear me? Yes? Now, the painting represents the fight between the man and the angel. And the iconography is convincing enough. The wings are conventional symbols for angels, and nobody will question that we have an angel here. Even if no mention of wings is made in this or any New te uh, Old Testament uh, Hebrew Bible story. The story mentions a distortion in Jacob's hip as evidence of the divine provenance of this antagonist, that is, after the fight, he will have a distorted hip. The knee and the hand on the figure's hip immediately convey this symbol, that is, this kind of strange twisting and that knee there of the angel uh, will immediately make us think that we have the distortion here. The man does not look the angel straight in the face. This also conforms to the story. The viewer who sees the painting is then reassured. Yes, we, we have this story. And you will fill in the, the, the story and remember the sequence well enough to assess the meaning of this particular element of it, right? So it works towards the idea of the pre-established story so far. Um, and again, the obedience to conventions gives the artist the freedom then to place his accents, to displace his accents and to distort the story in his turn. Because we know the, because we know the story, we do not challenge the representation as a version of it. Now, yet, had we not known the story, 
what would we make of this image? The face of the angel doesn't really look like that of a fighter. It is tender, feminine, and bent towards the other's face. The eyes of the bearded man are, if anywhere, fixed on the breast of what is clearly a feminine figure. And you could even see that little strip on her shoulder as uh, something related to that, although it could also be the theatrical device of fixing the wing. The gesture suggests an embrace more than a fight, and lovemaking is more obviously significant, uh, signified than wrestling. The Rem in, is Rembrandt then consciously misusing a biblical story for erotic goals of his own? We have to ask this question in terms of the etching that we will see later. That would be both unwarranted and a futile uh, uh, charge. We, he uses the story precisely as we cannot help using it ourselves as a relatively empty screen. That is, he is not making, poking fun at the story. That's, that's one thing I want to discard as a possibility. The story participates in that transferential exchange. It comes to stand in another light altogether. The ambiguous gender of this figure, who must be an angel because of the wings, yet seems so clearly feminine, backfires in a story when there is, where there is no unambiguous mention of the angel's gender at all. That is, we seem to have assumed that angels are male, and that's why we think that there is something strange about this image. But why would we assume that? Nobody ever says that that is the case. The angel can be female, and then the artist pulls in one direction. But the angel can also be male. It's not that clear. It's an ambiguous uh, figure. And then the scene pulls in another direction, projection, projecting, sorry, projecting the sexual ambivalence of Jacob's son, son onto the partner and the behavior of his father. The encounter, which was already a bit mysterious in the story, loses the aggression that at first sight we might have read into it. Uh, so, I mean, to say, if uh, with this image you go to the Bible, you get a different story, which is a, a kind of a reversal of the idea of influence. The point of the encounter, which held, among other things, the promise of divine election, but also critique of Jacob's previous misbehavior towards his relatives, is the application of a mark. This distortion is a mark, and that is a positive thing. The mark in the story is the distortion of Jacob's hip, a visible, visual, and permanent token of narrative events which were precisely based on invisibility. If you remember, Jacob deceived his father, Isaac, to steal the birthright precisely by taking advantage of his father's blindness. The moral ambivalence of the character, Jacob is an extremely morally ambivalent character and one of the cases of evidence that we should not read the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, as purely moral, that that's a distortion, a Christian bias, in fact. Um, Jacob is a very ambivalent character and that's precisely what he has to be. So the moral ambivalence of the character is represented in the painting by a sexual ambivalence. Thus, the meaning of the distortion brought about by the angel in the story becomes the key to the distortion of the painting on the story. So there is an unexpected, unexpected iconicity emerging. Paradoxically, story and painting, once brought together as text and metatext, but in a reversible relation, match better than they could have without the distortion. That is, the, the idea of distortion in the painting and in the story becomes the distortion of the story of the painting in relation to the story. Now, let's switch this off for a second just to get rid of the noise. I can't bear the noise. We have to switch it on again very soon. Now, in spite of the inherent difficulty of representing speech in painting, history painting knows many representations of scenes characterized by speech. And this is almost fatal that the, the most crucial scenes in, uh, in stories are very often <coughs> words, speech, uh, quoted speech. Now, this is now uh, this is for me the 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 occasion to bring in uh, the most common the, of the thir of the three devices, and uh, let's say that uh, that these devices are really kind of commonplaces in visual ana analysis. 
which I want to briefly bring up, and that is iconographic symbols of narrative events. You know, about iconographical analysis as ways of, of reading the image as a, uh, an intertext with previous uh, representations. Now, for speech, Rembrandt makes extensive use of the hands, which is one of the iconographical um, commonplace is to use hands of the figures in order to convey the idea that they are speaking. And in most of this, the many drawings of Joseph explaining dreams to his fellow prisoners, for example, which is a scene of speech, the youth stands in front of the two dreamers, the baker and the wine server, you remember in Genesis 40, that um, he explains that the one dream means that the guy is going to be released and the other means that the guy is going to die. And you see that in the figure that, uh, in the other drawing that I sent, that I distributed. Now, the viewer immediately recognizes in the gesture of the hands the oratory speech. That is, not only we see that he's speaking, but also that he's making a speech. He's orating. So we have no doubt that the drawing does in indeed represent the biblical story of Genesis 40. The detail of the hands is, as it were, translated into speech. When we, we read this drawing, we immediately make this connection. Yet again, recognition, which is here the principle, and we'll come back to this in two weeks, to the idea of recognition in, um, in art. Recognition, this recognition may blur the sight of the non-recognizable, iconographically unmapped signs. That is, iconography again, like sequentiality and condensation, concentration, will be used to do other things. For one thing, if you look here, the hands are not only expressing the movement that make them suitable to represent speech, they also point in different directions. One hand points upwards, the other downwards. And these directions, in turn, have a standard meaning and conventionally symbolize good and bad. Up means good, and bad means down, in a very conventional way. Now, in this case, good and bad knows. So we, re we know more than that he is speaking, we also know what he's saying. If that meaning is activated, then Joseph's standing position itself also denotes his superior power over the two older men. If we don't know the story, there is no reason, moreover, not to see in the hands a gesture of command. That is, if you forget about the particular story, you see here one man who is apparently dominating over two older men. Now, taken together, these possible interpretations of the hands of the standing figure demonstrate the superiority and semiotic capacity of this one visual detail, the hands, over the many verses in the biblical story that you need to tell all these things. In other words, the visual medium is not a confining limitation to the artist who wants to represent a narrative. On the contrary, it seems that Rembrandt could use the one device, iconographic symbols, to combine, beyond the recognizable meaning of the detail, other concerns of which the predictions of the power of the youth is the most telling one, because he is still here in prison at this moment, but he, very soon he's going to be the most powerful person under Pharaoh in Egypt. He's going to be viceroy of Egypt. Now, with this in mind, we are going to look at the two paintings of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. We are still not looking at the etching. The etching is the surprise for the end. First, serious work. Both paintings currently dated at, as of 1955. And, um, sorry, 1655. So they are kind of pretty late, 14 years before the painter dies, kind of mature paintings. And uh, one way of dealing with them is to say that in 19, in, sorry, in 1655, there was also a very long-running, successful performance in Amsterdam of Joseph in Egypt, a uh, uh, drama written by Vondel, the most uh, fashionable poet of the day. And although they hated each other, there is no reason not to, although there's also not much reason to assume that the paintings are a representation of the, of the staged uh, play. And according to some Rembrandt scholars, that is indeed the meaning. Now, I just want you to keep this in mind, because I, my claim will be that in one case, that's clearer than in the other. OK, now, 
if we take them as a sequence, which is ridiculous, a ridiculous thing to do for two paintings. OK. Um, if you take them as a sequence, this one would come as the second and this one as the first. Why? Because um, this is the accusation itself. And this is the next phase. Joseph is refuting it. I'm sorry for the color difference. This color is very bad, but this is also a less colored painting. But it's still a very bad slide, and that's because the slide is older and has suffered. So um, we could say here Joseph is protesting against the accusation. He's denying his guilt. And one reason to think of the play is that in the play this really happened. In the case of two different paintings, it doesn't make sense to see them as a sequence, though, even if they have been made in the same year. So we will talk more. We come back to this comic strip device a little bit, to the sequentiality, but um, not between the two paintings, but within. And then talk about the two other devices. Now, in both paintings, can you still hear me? I, it seems like I can hardly hear myself, but I don't need to, because I have the text. <laughs> now, in both paintings, the scene represents a concentration. So that is the second, like Rembrandt and the, uh, the, uh, Jacob and the angel. A, con a concentration of several sequential events from the story. If we look at Genesis 39 rather than at the play. Uh, Potiphar is being told about a seduction attempt long after the event in the Bible. Joseph's presence in the painting combines the earlier with the later event. That is, as if, they, as if he were caught on the spot by Potiphar. His position backwards in the, if you, if you see this foreground of the couple and then him, him at the background, at the other side of the bed represents not only the, his subdued position, but also the temporal, temporal anteriority of his presence. Since he shouldn't be there anyway, he's only there a little bit as a leftover of the previous scene. Seen in this way, Th that is, let's say, a version of the sequentiality principle, the comic strip device. Now, at the same time, the expression of desperate protestation in, the, in this painting, the Berlin painting, this one is in Berlin and the other one in Washington, um, also represents the later moment after the accusation. So on, in the sense of composition, it's the first, he is representing the first moment. And in terms of his gesture, the iconography, it's the last moment after the accusation. So the three phases, the seduction, the accusation, and the confrontation between Joseph and Potiphar are rep represented in two images, both double. Joseph at one side of the bed represents the earlier and first, and the later and third moments. Potiphar, clearly listening to his wife, represents the second moment, but is drawn by Joseph's second function into the third moment as well because he is listening to his wife, but since he's already protesting, he's also already involved with Joseph. Thus, this, this time is represented in space, but again, more effectively, more temporally than the story required. So it's hard to say that this is a representation of the story in that sense. This narrativization of the scene is not at all based on the story. Joseph and Potiphar do not meet with the woman together. This triangular relationship, uh, if we may call it that way, does not occur in the Bible. It does occur, uh, occur in the play. And there are reasons to think that this was done after the play, after this, this particular dramatic scene in the play. Because the woman seems to be a little bit in déshabillé, a little bit um, her, her, her uh, you know, as if something had really happened. And in the play that is explicitly said, Potiphar says, oh, my dear, what happened? Why are you so, uh, why is your dress so um, thumbled? Or how do you say that? What, what's, what's wrong with your dress and your hair? There's something wrong with the way you look. And then she accuses Joseph and etc. cetera. Um, also, in this painting, the third device, the iconographical use of the hands to represent speech is clearly used. The woman points to Joseph, and this gesture is so clearly indexical that its effect does not go beyond explicit signaling. You can say nothing else but, 
she's pointing at him because he did something wrong. With her left hand, the woman seems to be pro protecting her breast from the attack of the, of the uh, violator, of the rapist. So it's, she's holding her dress up because he tried to pull it down, supposedly. But within the context of the speech representation, that gesture is also part of the speech. That is, she's telling what Joseph did by uh, imitating it in a very vivid way. Now, Potiphar's right hand is resting on the chair slightly behind the woman. This is important as a difference with the other one. Thus creating a sense of intimacy between the two, which excludes the ac uh, accused uh, third. By this systematic use of the conventional narrative devices, I would say, the painting leaves nothing to guesswork. It is as adequate as a narrative, as a systematic narrativization, as it is uninterested interesting as a painted mythical text. It is, a, it is a translation and an illustration of, if not of the biblical story, at least of that play or of what he imagined. But it's very clear. You know what happens, right? There is no, no enigma in this painting, right? Now, the Washington painting, what happened? Oh, I'm sorry. What happened? Oh, no. I'm sorry about this. Okay, here we are. This is a different painting. I'll switch. You, you just ask me to show the other one for comparison whenever you feel like it, right? Now, the Washington painting is, um, is different in many ways. The same devices are employed at first sight. Sequentiality, the division of the space, the composition, narrative condensation and speaking hands, right? You see the hands again and you see everything is the same at first sight. The narrativization is, however, much more ambivalent. And like in the drawings, many more functions are allowed to the devices and the other de de details. I would say both overcoding and undercoding is at stake here. The hand with which the woman supposedly accuses Joseph does not point at him. It points perhaps to that red garment on the bedpost, the token of Joseph's misbehavior. But even that direction is not unambiguous. That is, you don't know exactly. She could also be pointing at the keys that he is wearing at his waist. Instead of gesticulating in despair, as Joseph did in the other painting, he stands still. I don't like the, the focusing. Is this better? Yeah. OK. He stands very still. He does not participate in the speech act, although his left hand is just a little bit above his arm, as if he was about to say something, but hesitated to do it. Now, the painting is so much more enigmatic than it is worthwhile approaching, approaching it from the other end, not from Joseph's side, but from the other side of the bed, and not from the Genesis story, but in itself, forgetting the Genesis story for a second. Potiphar's right hand is not, as it was in the Berlin image, behind the woman, but slightly in front of her. Now look at the difference um, of his hand. You see? It comes to the fore, right? Now, according to Gary Schwartz, a Rembrandt scholar, this thing has been done because there was a change in the cast, because Joseph was a different character now. I hope to show that that is a little slight, a little uh, shallow as an explanation. Potiphar's hand is slightly in front of the woman as if on its way to grasping her. And the woman, woman's gesture of protest, protecting her breast again is now in combination with the lesser distance between her and Potiphar's hand um, as if she were uh, holding off his grappling hand and in combination with some, another feature, another difference, that is his determined look in his face. He looks like he's going about his business. And again, if we, um, if we look at Joseph now, he is just standing there. He's not participating in this kind of frightening and anxious, anxiety-raising event between her and her husband, or her and the man. Who knows? Maybe it's not her husband. 
Joseph seems to be standing there, not as an accused uh, of a crime, but as a, de as a desirable, younger and more handsome love object. She's, if she, she may be kind of vaguely pointing to, no, stay away, you, I prefer the other side. However fanciful this interpretation may seem, and I'm sure you're going to tell me that this is my projection, and you're not wrong, because that's my whole argument. Um, there are several details to support it. The work of the light is much more subtle than in the Berlin picture. I'll quickly show the Berlin picture again. Um, you see, there was just light on the bed, and that's about it. Now, here it's much more subtle. The light falls on the bed and the woman in both, but in the Washington painting, Joseph is also very subtly illuminated, but from another source, not from the same source. You see, there's light coming from behind him. And this, this light produces a pattern in which the woman and the young man are illuminated, although separately, to the exclusion of the older man who is standing at the side. Joseph's face has an intense expression, yet unclear. There's no way to tell what exactly the expression is. Is it, hard? Is it anxiety, desire, admiration? You don't know. The curtain, much more clearly indicated in the, pre in the Berlin canvas as the realist representation of a bed curtain, is here so vaguely indicated that its only function seemed to be to set off Joseph as standing in a space lighter and further away at the other side. Now just compare the curtain. You see this curtain line going a little bit next to his head compared to here. If the color were better, you could see it clearer. But you can see that here we have a stage uh, curtain. Now, the most intriguing detail in this painting, I find, is the eyes of each of the protagonists. We remember how Thomas Mann used visuality to publicize the woman's love and speech to underline this visual drama. Mood's exclamation, oh my loves, what happened to you? Remember, your blood is flowing. Now, the sight of blood was there, a token of defloration, as well as of the visuality of love and the need of sympathy. Here, visuality is thematized, but the meaning it receives is in contrast with that in the novel. Each figure looks intense, but inwardly. No figure looks at, clear, at a clearly definable object. None looks at one of the others. The woman does not look at her husband. She seems to stare at an inner vision, the vision of her desire, maybe. The older man does not look at the woman. Maybe he looks at her breast. He seems to concentrate on his desire, which is of a different kind and with a different object. Joseph's look, not directed anywhere either, this is hard to see maybe on the slide, but I, I just went out to Washington and verified it again with some other people. And it's really, on the painting, it's very, very clear. He uh, doesn't look anywhere. He's, his look is even more inward than that of the two others, where at least there seems to be some kind of interaction. The separation between Joseph on the one hand and the couple on the other is radical. It's even more radical than one would think at first sight. When viewed from the other side of the bed, his image is almost detached as a painting on the wall. And that particular light that comes from the back sets him off. And if you really look, and this was very clear in, in, in Washington, if you follow the line, the side of the bed, that doesn't make sense. There is a, a curve. It's as if he were kind of floating above the bed rather than standing beside it. So. Joseph's image is itself the inner view, the preoccupation of the two other figures. So that, let's say that they are more real than he is on a different level of reality. When viewed in isolation, Joseph seems full of feelings, yet not involved in any event. And that is the image character of this, of this figure. Now, between these three still and intense looking figures, there is an object which attracts attention. And here we are going to prepare for the etching already. Attention, if not from the figures, at least from us. And that is the red garment that also is very clearly, although subtly, illuminated. Lying over the bedpost, the bedpost that is so strong in the etching. Standing, therefore, as an erect object between the woman and the youth. I'm not manipulating you at all. <laughs> 
The color of the garment reminds one of the blood which in Mann's novel testified to the desire of, of all the women. Should the garment testify here by its color and via blood as the event the woman is supposed to evoke in reality, let's say, having really happened? Or does it represent her desire, her hallucination that it happened? In other words, is she lying? On one level, she's lying to her husband about this rape attempt. On another level, she's hallucinating a real intercourse. Now, all these details point in the direction of fantasizing. They have led us far from Genesis, unless we reprocess Genesis on the basis of the painting, as we could do with Jacob and, um, and the angel. That is, here again, we may well wish to reverse the perspective and look at Genesis from the point of view of this painting. But um, I think we are well prepared now to go and look at the etching, which will tell the story once more and even more fantastically. But this, my claim about these paintings is that the one is an illustration of the play, while the other is uh, a fantasy, maybe evoked by the play, a transference where the play, and I don't even need the play, but it could be the play as well as the Genesis story. I don't care for the whole argument about the play, but in, in the one is an illustration and the other is a fantasy. It's a, it's a completely autonomous fantasy, or as far as you can ever have complete autonomy. Okay, let's put on the light and oh, deliver us from this noise. But they are nice paintings, aren't they? I have to, sorry, I have to retrieve my slides. Okay. Because if I forget to take them home, I will be absolutely deprived. Okay, now, the etching is another case of the Joseph and Potiphar's wife story. I don't know if you notice immediately the compar in comparison with the painting that there is a genre difference and also partly a medium difference. This work is not always included among Rembrandt's uh, biblical works, but treated um, pretty often as an eroticum. And this ambiguity in the reception, it is it produced in full scale here, so it is as small as it is here. Gives no information on the artist's position towards it. There is no evidence that it was printed in a Bible, for example. And so much the better for the discussion, because we don't need that kind of evidence. I ventured earlier to propose that a myth is a screen for transference, right? I've said that many times also today and especially last week. And in spite of our good luck with the case of Mann, we must accept that in general there's no way to tell the transference from uh, the transference of the artist on the screen that the Bible or whatever provided him from the transference of the semiotician desperately trying to argue against the stability of myth. So I'm not going to claim that I can say this is Rembrandt and this is me. Um, I think we have to accept that we can. Um, but fortunately, the transference is precisely a dynamic relation, and it's the dynamic that we're talking about, so we have a little bit of good luck at least. Now, the first feature of the S etching compared to the paintings is, of course, the relation between genre and subject. The paintings, by definition, public works, whether they were displayed in churches, in town halls, or in, on the uh, chimney pieces of the burghers' houses on the canals in Amsterdam, the uh, paintings were, by definition, public and represent the later event when the woman is dressed again. The etching, by definition, more private, smaller, and more suitable to be tucked away, to be consummated in private, represents the more overtly sexual scene. Yet, this is not pornography, even not an eroticum, as I hope to show. There is not much eroticism in this female body, for example. This distribution between the, uh, the etching and the paintings is not indifferent for the interpretation of the three works together and makes a further case for an interpretation in which repressed desire has a place. But I'm going to argue that the way the repressed desire was, uh, uh, was signified in the painting was m much more acceptable, publicly acceptable. And that's not only Maybe not at all, because here there is a nude. Now, let's see that. What, what is the screen that we start out on? Um, we have to somehow define what, what we consider the starting point. 
let's say the subject, the title, although the title was brought in later. And what we know that the title evokes, we immediately, if we say, oh, this is Joseph and Potiphar's wife, somebody came to that conclusion apparently and gave it a title, then we have all kinds of associations immediately. And that is already different for each of us. Now, then we have the composition of the image in its most immediate form. And there are three aspects that strike immediately, at least that struck me immediately. And here I'll tell you later the story of a very different immediate reaction. The body, the woman's body, there's something wrong with that body, right? The composition of the image, the, the light and dark and all that, and the position of the spectator as I, I constructed it, but who knows, maybe somebody would like to argue for another spectator position. Now, the body of the woman doesn't look real at all. Something's wrong with it, and we'll come to explain what is wrong with it. It is twisted in the first place. The upper part is turned towards Joseph. The lower part is turned away from him toward the lower other corner of the image, right? You tell me if you don't agree, because there's going to be pretty wild reactions here. The composition has a specific relation between diagonal and vertical lines, and I did that little, um, in your handout that I gave you last time, you, uh, you have these, these kind of schematic representations of that structure. In the first, you have the division between vertical and diagonal lines, and some of these lines are straight and others are curved, as you see in the second. I'm building this up very carefully. The straight line at the bottom right is the dominant line. It's stronger than the other lines. You agree so far? The top left vertical is very slight, while the curved lines are not very striking as lines, although they do work as uh, principles of composition. Now, about the spectator position, there is a double position. The external view, say ours, is directed inside the image by collaboration between that vertical line and the light, the direction of the light in the curve. And that play of dark and light is, of course, very representative, or very characteristic of Rembrandt. It directs the view from the top, bottom right to the middle, then to the top left, right? That's how we go until we hit, we hit the uh, internal diegetic spectator position, Joseph's eyes, right? And then what do you see when you look very well at his eyes? They look back, although it's not very clear what they look at. Do they look at? They travel back, in fact, via the, wo the woman's tummy to the lower part of the bedstead, right? We have to be, um, we have to, Follow. So we come in, we go as far as Joseph, and then we look back at, to the place where we entered the image. And that ambiguity is what has been represented in the fourth of these uh, little sketches. Now, this, the fifth and the sixth we'll talk about later. Now, if I take uh, this, this, let's say, this minimal description as the screen, and this is, of course, not a very a reliable way of going about it, but it's, it's a kind of tentative, hypothetical um, attempt to establish a screen, and then we go on and work on it and, and transfer on it. Now, this is also a little bit supported by evidence in terms of other critics who don't at all go into the same kind of speculations about it as I'm going to do, but who also talk about these lines and about um, the, the light and dark, etc. Now, mythical labor, let's say our mythical labor, my mythical labor, I don't know if I say our, I, I, in fact, I can only mean my own because I haven't looked into your brains, starts where the title of the work meets the work as screen in the spectator's projection of fantasies. And the title then functions as a shifter, producing that aha erlebnis, that sense of, oh yeah, I know, which seems to be triggered by the representation but is in fact utterly, an utterly personal response to it coming from that verbal title. And you know when you go to a museum that the first thing you look at is the little label that tells you who painted it before and what it is before you look at the work. And when that little label says untitled, you are frustrated. Don't say no, I know you are. Now, let me begin then but with uh, somewhere that seems reasonable, the external spectator position, right? Entering the image from the bottom right-hand corner, emphasizing the diagonal line, 
Hence, the woman turns away from me. While I look, the first thing I see of her is her sexual parts, right? Do you agree? Contradict me if you don't. I follow this line as far as Joseph's face, and then I look back with him. Now, try to do that. And this look, you want to say something? Yeah, it's about Joseph looking back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't see it, that. It, it don't looks to that. me as though he is looking out of the painting. Uh huh. Or at some object yeah. to the left. I see him looking away, and then yeah that's coming that's coming yeah sure the, the hand is is the next thing and the feet but uh, the eyes yeah I, in the original that was pretty clear that the eyes look back um, well, you'll have me you'll have to trust me and um, you'll be rewarded by nice play of eyes <laughs> but I don't know if that's enough so they're, they're not in any case they're not looking at the his head is in one direction and his eyes are looking yeah, towards Yeah, yeah, of course. There is an amb ambiguity, a very deep ambiguity. It's, it's almost a uh, visual equivalent of free and direct discourse when you look back with him. Um, and, and no, I mean, this, this is not a joke, and we'll come back to that next, uh, next week when we talk. Or no, tomorrow maybe? No, next, next time, uh, when I, uh, in two weeks, uh, when we talk about visual focalization more specifically. Now, when I do this, when I go, assume that he looks back and look back with him, what I do then is identifying with the text internal character, with, which we do all the time when we read uh, realist psychological Henry James-like novels, right? In terms of in narrative theory, I am embedding into the I am embedding within the outside focalization an internal focalizer, right? Now, if I do that and I look back with him, what I see is that belly, that extremely fat belly that kind of protrudes out of, of her body. And I also see the vertical bedpost, but I do not see her sexual parts because the belly hides them. Now, then I come back at the beginning and I go back again and then I see her sexual parts. And you are in a movement here, a to and fro movement that is uh, like the rabbit and the duck. You see the one or you see the other, but never the two at the same time. There is an, a, a, a visual ambiguity here that is uh, kind of un unavoidable. You can see both, but not at the same time. Now, the external focalizer is by definition absent from the image, right? We are not in the image. We are not represented. So potentially, I don't know if you had the time to look at the Freud uh, chapter, the, the first of his essays on the theory of sexuality. You are a voyeur, by definition, when you look. And as he says, there is a very re close relation between looking and touching. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Susanna and the elders, where uh, the voyeur comes into action. Now, we are potential voyeurs. I'm not saying that we are voyeurs. We are potential voyeurs. We could become voyeurs. Now, entering the image at the bottom of the vertical object, it becomes easy to identify the spectator position with that object because that's where we start. The vertical's object, contiguity with the outside, its ending at the very edge of the frame, makes it a suitable candidate for the function of mediator between us and the diegesis, the story. This mediation produces, then, a, a kind of um, internal focalization in itself. That is, that the focalization gets internal as soon as you're there. Its strong presence as vertical, as opposed to the weak lines of the other vertical object, the door at the other side, and we'll talk about the door, suggests to me that I also take it as contiguous to another space, the psychoanalytic frame of reference. And it's hardly hard to avoid, and I hope that you did not, not go through big trouble to avoid that, to associate it with the phallus. Right? Now, we are all decent people, but you had 20 minutes to look at this and, and on your own, so you don't have to. Uh, uh, <laughs> you're, you're not accountable for what you saw, but there is clearly a phallic symbol there. More specifically, it comes to stand as a symbol of both the outsider's position, because it mediates there, and the scepter of power, which in turn signifies power in general, power inherent to the position of the voyeur with the phallus. So the voyeur is now a male voyeur. The object represents the outside viewer in absentia, but that position becomes very gender specific. It becomes a man who looks right into the woman's sexual parts. That is not an 
ideologically not an innocent position to take. If we bring the function of signifying the absence to bear on the inside focalizer's position, we begin to grasp the kind of storytelling that's at work here. Indeed, there is one conspicuous absence in the image compared to the two paintings, an absence signified in the etching subject, which states the absence presence, Potiphar, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. So Potiphar is there, whatever you, you want to make of it. The outside focalizer then becomes a motivator. Potiphar's absence is required for the first part. This is a, a, the kind of use of that device of condensation. Of the f Potiphar's absence is required for the first part of the story to take place, while his presence within the mind of both, both characters is required for the second part of the event. That is, it's required in order for the seduction attempt to take place, whoever is the seducer, but he must be present in order to avoid that the, the intercourse takes place. Now, the insistence in the biblical text on this double status of the man in the closed space of the house, uh, I, I briefly talked about that last time, gets lost in the King James translation. But that is very clear in the Dutch Statenvertaling of 1618 and 1619, that is, like 15 years before this etching was done. And although there is no evidence of which translation Rembrandt possessed, and there's even no evidence and no reason to assume that he went, went out to, of his way to read the text before setting out to represent it in, in his visual works, it is likely that the influence of this translation was, so to speak, around as a cultural context. Pretty much in the same way that Svetlana Albers claims that po the polemics surrounding Keplerian optics views were around in the culture and influenced Dutch 17th century uh, painting in, in that domain. So uh, that is why I've tried to enhance the meeting, pl meeting place of the Hebrew text and this Dutch translation in the working translation that I have appended to, the, uh, uh, to, to that handout. Uh, that is, um, I try to kind of play with the idea that the, he the Stadenvertaling was a gesture of literal translation as opposed to Catholic uh, distortions of the Bible. And if that was the context, the religious context, and that is pr pretty clear that that's at least the context, vaguely cultural context in which he lived, um, you might say that this, there is a historical specificity here of this Joseph, which is related, among other things, to the political background of that literalism of the translation. And you could, you could think that that is part of Rembrandt's screen, that is the notion of, of representing this little etching in a frame. Of course, you have to have a frame, but the frame is thematized by representing this phallus standing on the limit of the frame, having a closed door at the other side, which is weaker than, than this thing. And the whole sense of closure is pretty strong in the whole thing. And that is part of why this could not be a public painting. The, the paintings have, don't have that sense of closure that the etching has. And the word for prison in Hebrew, I think I told that last week, the word for prison in Hebrew is closed house. And that comes across in the Dutch translation and not at all in the King James. You just have prison. But he is between a closed house and a closed house. And refusing the one, he goes to the other. Now, Joseph and, jo Joseph's ambiguous eyes gain their meaning from the phallic object's mediating position between inside and outside. He reacts to the woman with attraction and repulsion, and he reacts to that object, the father, the fatherly position, the outside position. That, that it's not for nothing, nothing that it's not only inside, this father is standing there inside the space of the woman, but he's also ready to go out. You want to ask a question? Yeah, that has been pointed out to me before. I hadn't seen that. That, that is, there is a possible pan there. The pillow looks a little bit like a man's torso. That's true. Yeah, yeah, right. So turning the chamber pot. Yeah, yeah. The chamber pot, I must say, is a very, very uh, traditional iconographic element, which is not in the painting. No, because the chamber pot stands for a bad scene. It stands for a sexual scene. But in a very conventional way, yeah. But a lot of <laughs> very interesting. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's be serious again. Voyeurism. Now, what's voyeurism? It's characterized by non-communication, right? 
uh, the attraction of the position is its safety as distinct from actual sexual uh, intercourse where you are together. Um, it is a safe position. You look without being looked at. There is no mutuality in the position. Now, the fatherly position, which coincides here with the voyeuristic position, is the position of legal rights and also the position of, in time, of having done it, of experience. The father sets the rules, possesses the woman, and has the, the law on his side to exclude the son from sex with the woman. And it is the position which, as I said, belongs to a different time, the elder generation to which the son does not belong. And this perspective of time comes in in a very interesting way. Now, integrating these aspects of the position, we can say that Joseph is confronted with the witness of the scene, a witness which is the internalized law that forbids, forbids him to do what, on another level, he seems to be doing, that is, to look at the naked body of the woman, of the father's wife, and what's the father's wife other than the mother. Now, it is here that we can again assess the difference between the two paintings. Well, the Berlin painting represents the explicit confrontation, which in the Genesis text never took place, but does take place in the play. The Washington painting, by the internalized looks of the figures whose gazes do not meet, comes much closer to what this intimate little etching is most suited to convey because of the genre of the etching. The internalization of the measure of guilt but then, interestingly, in the painting, the guilty, the guilty man was Potiphar, who was coming down with his hand and was well, held off by the woman. And Joseph was, had the status of the fantasized, internalized object of desire. Here, Joseph's guilt is represented, and Potiphar is fantasized in this bedstead, in this bedpost. The story represented here is an internal one, a story of conflictual feelings, not a drama so overt that only the biblical background can save it from melodrama. And uh, because this, this uh, tragedy of Joseph in Egypt that was staged in, uh, in 1659, 55, was kind of very awful melodrama and would never have been possible culturally if it weren't for the biblical background that makes, cleans everything, makes everything proper. Now, Joseph is looking where he shouldn't be looking. But perhaps he's doing even more. And we were talking about hands, right? We cannot simply attribute the figure's hands here to this iconographic uh, meaning of speech that would be out of place in the whole thing. In combination with the ambiguity of the focalization and other signs of ambiguity, we can see his hands at, as what they are. They are grappling for the body. Although they are also holding off, they are doing both. This whole body of Joseph, his hands, his eyes, his head, and his feet are equally ambiguous between the, the head and the body, even if you're not convinced by the eyes. Between the head and the body, there is a contradiction. The head is turned away, already reaching the door of escape. You could say that his head, in visual surface terms, is beyond the door. But the eyes turn back, looking at the woman and at the father, and the hands push away and grapple. The reader is not convinced of this is then invited to follow with a pencil. Oh, sorry, I'm saying the reader, this is because this is a draft for a paper. <laughs> the, you guys, huh? if you're not convinced of this, take a pencil now and follow with the pencil the line of the fold in the garment that the woman is holding. Now, this is a rabbit or duck case. You see? You just follow. No, you're not doing what I told you to do. You take your pencil, you start at the hand, uh, under the hand, you take it and you follow what she's holding, and you go down, and you have that little bend, okay? Are you all set? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Who sees it? Who doesn't see it? Well, you know, if you don't know if you doesn't, you want me to do it for you? Okay, I'll just do it and pass it around. And then we can, you can make this a very dirty thing, but this is, this should do. But then her, but well, the, if, if it gives it away, then her hand is, is her hand in the, it couldn't be in a position of resistance or. No, or no, she is, she is, in another physical position. she is doing something else, right? 
Now, this is a rabbit or duck case. And in the sense that once you've seen it, it's impossible not to see it. But if you don't see it, you don't see it. This is a very interesting kind of ambiguity. Now, technically, the woman's hand does hold a fold of the garment, because really, it's not the case that there's, there's no lie. There, she is holding a fold in the garment, and at the same time, she's holding a gigantic erect penis, right? To tell you the truth, the painful and indecent truth. Now, <laughs> given the firmness, now here's the evidence, the firmness of the grip and the looseness of the garments, of, of the material of the garment, you should see the difference, right? There should be small folds right under her hand. And there are none. The absence of these folds, although not at all conspicuous, does allow the rabbit to become a duck, or the garment to display what is hidden underneath it. The uh, object the hand holds is hard, no less hard than the bedpost. It's even in rivalry, in competition with the bedpost. Now we recall the garment, red in color, stiff in substance, erect in position, in the Washington painting. Remember? I, I warned you about this session. You could walk away in the beginning. Now it would be impolite and a little strange to do it. Now, and again, we may wonder what Joseph is vaguely staring at. On the level of the explicit Genesis reference, the woman is already grasping the garment for betrayal, but the etching with the detail that the medium allowed for it to be contemplated in isolation, don't forget that, in, that is, in a situation where fantasizing is more easy, shows the boy as being still tempted, fantasizing an event that is ambiguous in its turn. I was claiming that in the Washington painting, it's the woman who fantasizes the desired youth and the man who fantasizes the rival. And what he's fantasizing at, we don't know. He or he is mainly, the, the let's say, the, the hero of fantasy. As the, and why is this so, such an attractive fantasy? as the passive object of sex. He would both enjoy it and be innocent. He, is as, he would be as erect as the father, but not seen in that position, because there is still the garment. Now, the ambiguity of Joseph's feet frames that of the fold within a story, which we could call the story of the sun. One foot <laughs> turns away from the scene, and the other points to the scene. Right? But what exactly does it point to? To the bottom of the vertical object. The foot is ready to go there. In other words, to the aspect of the phallic object which brings together the inside and the outside, the aspects of voyeurism and legitimacy. Now, and if you allow me to jump to conclusions here, Joseph's attitude is that of an athlete ready to jump. Again, a technical feature which is just not very conspicuous, but nevertheless telling, allows this interpretation. I'm not saying that it triggers it, it allows it. Physically speaking, Joseph's weight rests on the wrong leg. If he wants to go away in the direction of the door, he should rest on his other leg, since the woman then would pull him back, and he would be in that sense. But why, does not he, why doesn't he do that? He doesn't flee in that direction, because the door is closed. The door, the house is a closed house, as the Hebrew word for prison indicates. So in, according to the Hebrew and to this Dutch translation, it would be a choice between a, a prison and a prison, right? Two closed houses. There is only escape for Rembrandt's Joseph, and in fact, for the viewer who is drawn to identification with him, at that one point at the other side of the bed, at the bottom right-hand corner. And the character is preparing to do that, to jump from the son position to the father position. Now, in order to clarify this and make up for my own jumping, let me go back to the ambiguity of the image as a whole, which started at the doubleness of the focalization. Identifying with the fatherly position, the spectator is committed to seeing what the peeping father or woman owner sees, right? That's the first thing. You cannot avoid looking right into this woman's sexual parts, and that was my experience, my immediate shock when I saw it. And by the way, the, uh, I, I promised you the story of another uh, viewing of this. I showed this image to my brother when I had already written a, a previous draft of this paper. And he said, oh my god, are you going to talk about that in public? And I said, yeah, I know, it's very shocking. And we talked for five minutes, and then suddenly it turned out we were talking at cross purposes, because he had not seen this woman's body. All he had seen was that phallus, that penis that I just showed you, and that I had not seen. I had written a whole paper, I had not seen it. 
this is to say that screen, you know, where you begin with the screen and the transference is really not so clear. Now, I said that there was an embedding of focalization. Within this view, we look with Joseph, uh, we first look with the, the father, the, the, the woman owner, and then we look with Joseph. So within the father's view, we look with Joseph. In other words, it's the father's, ultimately it's the father's fantasy that embeds the son's fantasy. Do her eyes pass that on? Yeah, no, yeah. Yes, we, we, have to, we have to talk about her. Where is my copy with the penis uh, that has passed around? <laughs> Not that I need it, but I will. Um, yeah, her, her eyes seem to look nowhere, kind of up. We maybe have time to talk about that also. Her face doesn't seem to belong to her body. And some people claim that it's a Rembrandt face, it's a self-portrait face. It, it is absolutely not attached to the body in any way. Um, now, if we look first with the man and then embed it with Joseph, we notice with fright that the letter seems to shrink, seems to shrink back from the transgression, but in fact is attracted by the perspective. Identifying with the son, the father sees the other side of the fold in the garment, that is, the father has this fantasy, oh my God, what's my son doing? Paradoxically, the father's fright can only be understood and experienced, and we remember here uh, Thomas Mann's women, when the outsider enters the image and identifies through the father, embedded in the father's fantasy, with Joseph. And uh, so in, in a different medium and with a, with a different effect and taking different positions, Rembrandt is using the same device as Thomas Mann in the scene with the little knives. But we are the onlooker who are affected by the sight. That is, we are supposed to have this erection, and in that sense, it is a pornographic image. Only in that sense, or a pornographic or an erotic or whatever, an image that is meant to affect the viewer. In that case, however, we should win wonder what the transference is after, what is supposed to happen, what the problem is that the character focalization can only bear when shared with others. I'm claiming then that Joseph uh, identifying with Joseph, we are doing what the, the women did in the scene in Thomas Mann, identifying with the woman. Now, the father, what, what is this frightening thing that he cannot see alone? The father, as I said, looks at the sexual parts of the body, and the boy only sees the belly. The belly is fat, very ostensibly so, and Rembrandt was criticized for it by his contemporaries. There is evidence that Rembrandt was also the only, or one of the few painters in his time who used female models, uh, real women, unlike other painters who, who used men and then added some breasts and, and deleted some other aspect. Now, he was criticized, and indeed this is absolutely not the image of a female body. This is not a female body. In combination with the status of the focalizer who watches and interprets it, the protruding feature of the belly may well be associated with pregnancy. If you look, if you just hide the one side and only, if you cover the one side and only see what he sees, the belly is excessively fat and not in, in relation to the rest of the body. So, and that is what a pregnant belly is. It's more, it's, it's, it's not really fat, it's just protruding. On the other hand, now cover the other side in combination with the other focalizer. Now what you see is, a hairless vagina, which is a little bit too big for the body, short fat thighs, and the position of the left leg, which is the position, I don't know if you ever change diapers with a baby girl, that's what you see, right? This is this automatic falling apart of the two legs of a baby girl. That's what, what you see there. Now, the meaning if, of these two different, even contradictory interpretations of the same body depends on and only makes sense in terms of the focalizers. The young boy sees a mother, a woman of the elder generation, who as a primary love object attracts him, but who as belonging to the father is inaccessible to him. And this belly, which on the one hand shows her motherhood, and on the other hand literally blocks access to her sex, is, is, is a very effective, powerful means to, to express this. He rejects, if ambiguously so, the perspective of being undressed by this naked woman, for that would be both a transgression and a regression. But being dressed, he can have this erection nevertheless. The father, in his direct focalization, sees a baby girl, that is, 
a female of the younger generation. In his view, this woman belongs to Joseph's category, and that's the danger. In his frightened fantasy, she cannot but be attracted by the handsome youth. This is his jealousy, because she is younger. The father's anxious jealousy and the son's fear of initiation are represented by the ambiguous structure of focalization of the strangely twisted body that blocks both men's sight and that itself is nowhere. She just is not there. There is no woman. There's a baby and a, and a, and a belly. Now, what about the leap, then, the most narrative of events, yet most visually represented? Jumping is skipping, going to and fro between the two starting points of the readings of the image. The spectator, just like the two focalizers, has been skipping, jumping over the embedded body of the woman. And that is exactly what the two focalizers are busy doing. They are dealing with each other. The father is afraid of competition with the son, expressed in the childish view of the woman which identifies her with the younger generation, the other side. The son is afraid of the father's interdiction to compete with him, to gain access to his domain, but he's equally afraid of winning and of losing that competition. Between him and the fatherly position, there is the body of the woman, an obstacle in terms of space and in terms of sight, initiation in terms of time. That's what he has to go through, and now you see why I compare this to the Thomas Mann novel. We cannot simply say, then, that the spatial dimension of visual art is suitable to represent space as a symbol of time. The initiation is a temporal moment, as a temporal moment is an obstacle, and the spatial representation is the most adequate way of signifying that. And now you have to think of those initiation rites that are around in so many uh, communities in the world where the time of initiation is represented in space going into the wilderness, right? going into the mountains and, uh, and stay there for a while and then come back as a different person. That is also a spatial representation of a, t a temporal uh, thing. It is because of the blockage of sight represented by the strangely twisted body that we come to realize how serious this blockage is for a youth who cannot help being confronted with the jealous father. The text of the image represents metatextually the impact of sight and the lack thereof. Similarly, so that is why this woman is a text and not a woman. There's no realism whatsoever in this. Similarly, the notion of distortion was represented in such a way in figure four. Um, figure four is the, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the angel, Jake, Jacob and the angel, remember? Uh, that we understood only with the help of this representation what the distortion was about, that is, it, it backfired on, on the story. Now, what Joseph, as an image internal, hence limited focalizer, cannot know is that once on the other side, the right side of the image, or just the right side, Joseph will have to assume with the fatherly position it's ambiguous looking back at the competing son, and then the whole story begins again. And you see what I'm getting at. Through this etching, I would like to go back and look at the Thomas Mann novel, where, as I said, Joseph becomes very unattractive at a certain point. And you see that, in a way, the same is happening here, except that he doesn't become unattractive, but he becomes a bedpost. The embedding position is decisive, and, in most narrative, and in, it is the most narrative of the visual devices for storytelling employed in this little work, this embedding thing. In spite of the competing ver vertical fold still hidden in ambiguity, it is the thing at the bottom right that clearly has won the competition between the two vertical objects. That is, the, 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 his penis is not visible. The door is too weak to escape on that side. What you have left is this thing that blocks our side, although it also leads our side. It is doubly opposed to the door at the upper left. It is, if we may say so, discursively stronger. The door is closed, whereas the sceptre is already in the woman's space, delimited by the curtain. And outside, as delimited by the frame, at the exit, it disposes of and guards. In other words, it's also standing at the door, but at the, the real door. And if you want to see the woman's space, you can turn the image on the side, and then you get a much stronger sense of female sexual imagery. And if that is... Um, an acceptable way of looking at it, then the woman becomes the penis, 
with all she is already. She, she is the penetrating penis into her own space. But that is a prendre à laisser. The door, in any case, at the left, is not a viable exit. There is no spectator position at the top left outside. We cannot enter the image there. There is no way to turn back from, because time moves on and sons becomes, become fathers. And that is a very powerful storytelling here that is done, that tells the story, in fact, of the whole Oedipal crisis and the generation conflict. Now, to wind up briefly about um, this and the previous uh, session about this, this storytelling and myth uh, business. If we simplify, we say that both Thomas Mann and Rembrandt use the biblical story of Genesis 39 as a screen and forget about on the one hand, Mann's other Arabic versions and other things he read, and on the other hand, Rembrandt's play, uh, Vondel's play that Rembrandt probably saw, or may have saw, a scene I'm not even so sure because, no, again, there's no evidence. It's obvious that they both these works have aspects in common, but what they have in common is not precisely what they have in common with the source text. Uh, all the, all this, uh, this whole business of initiation and danger, and it's not so, it's, it's, it's completely different. And on the other hand, they both leave out very striking aspects of the Genesis, which in turn is doubtlessly very different from its own screen, because that didn't come out of the blue either. That, that was also already in a tradition. And then both Mann and Rembrandt focus on aspects not present in Genesis. And while Mann shares with Laplanche and Pontalis's definition of fantasy and primal fantasy, remember, a challenge of the distinction between the subjective and the intersubjective. That was the issue in the comparison between those two definitions and the novel. The defloration scene stages that challenge, so to speak, horizontally in a scenic artic articulation, whereas Laplanche and Pontalis try to obliterate the distinction by means of a vertical perspective of origin, explained as the, the, or as the onto, uh, phylogenetic origin, remember? Now, Freud's myth, the story of the taboo of, uh, what was it? No, totem and taboo, sorry. The end of totem and taboo. Freud's myth of the, the sons who eat the father is in no way related to the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Rather, it represents a struggle between positivism and fantasy. But that we have seen also happening in the novel and in the etching. However, the problems of the relations between father and son seem to be connected with the relation between positivism and fantasy. For as we have seen, Freud's text shares with Rembrandt's etching a double-leveled representation of the composition between fathers and sons in the story and the discourse that represent it. I remind you of that, the fact that in, in the very sentence in which he is saying the sons are going to eat the father, he has this footnote hiding behind a father figure, an authority. Now, of course, my point in these two sessions was not to say that each, each version, each occurrence of a mythical signifier is different, for that is commonplace. We know that. They are all different. Nobody would deny that. But I would argue that the relation between a mythical unit and its so-called versions is not a relation of interpretation, but a relation of transference, of active uh, recuperating roles and positions. Such a relation is mutual, dynamic, historically specific, and discursive. It's a discursive relation. As a consequence of this uh, point, a mythical unit is not a unit of meaning, but a signifying structure. So a mythical unit, a mythical version, is a signifier rather than a signifier. And it can be thanks to the fact that the opposite seems to be the case. It is the illusion that makes that possible. We are used to referring to myths in terms of what we take to be a summary of their content, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. But what does that say, in fact? And which we can easily displace from one text onto another, the titles of the history paintings. But it is the action imposed on the myth that is the myth. The summary then becomes an empty signifier which triggers other signifiers. And we replace a Freudian from an, with a Lacanian perspective. And the mythical discourse emerges there. One consequence 
of this view is that there is no inherent privilege for either one of the verbal and the visual arts as the most suitable medium for storytelling. And in parenthesis, I mentioned the Lacanian uh, semiotics that is be underlying this. This, the opposition between the phallic father here and Joseph's penis is also the opposition between a, uh, a Freudian symbol and a Lacanian signifier, a Lacanian icon that is hidden but remember the purloined letter debate where the letter that they were looking for was ostensibly there and that's why they couldn't see it. Now this penis is so gigantic that you couldn't see it. Well, the symbol you could. The distortion, if we may use that word now, the disguise of the symbol allows you to acknowledge it while the, 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 the iconicity of that other thing did not allow you to see it. Now in Persian terms, talking about icons, we can say that an indexical relation between the screen and the myth becomes possible on the basis of the illusion of an iconic relation between the myth and the screen. Because we assume that they are the same, we can do something more dynamic, on whose basis the producer of the new myth thinks that she or he can establish an indexical relation, like Mann's polemic response, which was another type of index. Mythical thinking, which consists of that illusion, and the adoption of the universalistic fallacy is at work in the very discourses that attempt to deconstruct it. Myth criticism on the one hand and psychoanalysis on the other. And th that is in fact what I wanted to say. Um, I'll leave you 20 minutes to challenge it.